All right. Thank you, number one, thank you very much for having me, and um, I'm honored to be here. I realize everybody here is giving up an hour of their life you're never going to get back. So I will do the best I can so that hopefully when you walk out you'll say, well, at least it wasn't a complete waste of the hour. I would emphasize to you my, my quest today is to give you the neurosurgeon's perspective on spine care. Now, I, a couple of... Uh, you know, warnings, like on the side of a cigarette pack. Um, I generally don't give very politically correct uh, talks in the United States. I will do the very best I can to be non-offensive in all regards, but I'm not famous for that, actually. And I have operated on a fair number of politicians, and although I don't like politicians, I try to do a good job on them as well. But I'm going to present just the neurosurgeon's perspective on this. I finished my 10,000th operation last July, which doesn't mean anything other than like a person who's done 10,000 air conditioners, this is something I mostly can get done now. But I would emphasize, I lecture quite a bit on cervical spine surgery at our neurosurgery meetings, and I long ago realized the older you get, the more you do. You know, your 5,000th operation is a lot easier than your 500th. And the older I get and the more I've done, the more I realize there are many ways, many ways to achieve the goal you're trying to achieve. When I was younger and when people first come out of residency, unfortunately some people, particularly orthopedics people, hang on to this, it's my way or the highway. There's one way, that's my way. That's almost never true. So if I, if I deviate from what the feeling and the current thought is, I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying we have a way to do it, you have a way to do it. I operate five days a year in Germany usually. I just go work with a guy in Frankfurt who's a big CO, C1, C2 guy. It's fun. You know, I learn, he, hopefully he learns. They have a different way of doing it there. You know, it's different than what we do. It's not all different. It's some different. I learn from him, hopefully he learns from me, so if I offend anybody that, no, I don't agree with that, that's not what we do. Chill out, relax, okay, just relax. Just one person's way of doing this. Now, why do I have a picture of a brain at a spine talk? Uh, the reason is this, and it's really a fundamental principle to everything we're going to talk about. This is not a hard decision-making case. This is a young man who's 38 that I operated on about 8 or 10 weeks ago. He came to my office with very bad headaches. That's it. Neurologic exam is normal. Okay? Yes, even to a, I know I'm not a neurologist, but I can do an okay exam. An MRI is worth a room full of neurologists. But still, you do the neuro exam. There's no reason for this exam to be anything other than normal. The complication of this particular problem, I know this is a neuro, not a neurosurgery exam. I'll give you a hint. That's the problem. Okay? The complication of this disease is you get obstructive hydrocephalus and you die because you can't drain your ventricle. So I got his MRI. He's got a big colloid cyst. This is a benign cyst full of colloid protein. He did not obstruct his ventricle. The form in Monroe is right there. So I went through the frontal lobe of the brain and we took this out and that's not a big deal. You can argue about how to do this. You're going to go transfrontal, you're going to go interhemispheric, blah, blah, blah. Okay? There's a lot of ways to take this out. You can argue about that. But that this is going to be done, there's nothing to talk about, right? That's coming out, or he's not going to live. So the decision in the brain cases, there's not much art form to that. You get your MRI, you've got your mass in the brain. You can argue a little about small ones, but mostly the decisions are easy. In the spine, there's a real art form to taking care of the spine because this, there are so many different ways to do it and it all starts with the history. Who do you operate on? Who don't you? Who gets this conservative care, care? Who doesn't? How long do you wait? The spine is much more difficult, oddly enough, decision making. My residents that I'm training all think that the brain's much more complicated. The surgery has a little different kind of risk, but the decision making is pretty easy in the head actually. So some basic parameters. Now, the first bullet looks so arcane, so obvious, is why would you even say that? Best treatment for disease is to avoid the disease. When I was a resident, 
intracranial pressure monitoring had just come out for severe head injury. So you get a really bad head injury, we drill a little hole in the skull, we pass a two millimeter tube into the ventricle of the brain and we measure brain pressure. I was very excited about this when I first started. And my, attend my chairman came up and I said, gee, Dr. McDonald, I really would like to put a monitor in this kid's brain. It was a young person who'd been in a bad car accident. And he looked at me and he said, Paul, the best treatment for a head injury, don't get one. And I thought, what a foolish thing to say. But of course, that was exactly the right thing to say. Head injury in the United States last year from car accidents was the lowest since 1968. And it's not because of neurosurgeons, right? Airbags, seat belts, crush fronts of the car. So he was exactly right. You know, we don't spend much money on polio because you don't, for the most part, get it anymore. So you, every disease you're going to treat, the best thing to do, don't get the disease to begin with. And some of the conservative care is directed towards that aspect. Preventative care, it's cheaper, it's more effective. This is particularly directed towards the younger population, which I understand, but of course, I would suspect, I don't know this scientifically, but I would suspect athletes probably play longer than they used to play, and we all live longer. So even those of us that aren't athletes, which you can tell by looking at me, I am not, but we're all aging, and so as the spine ages, just like every other joint, it su it's suffers more of the vagaries of life. If you can't eliminate the disease, and this is mostly a mechanical structure, so at least at, least at this point in, in nature and medicine, we don't have a way to totally prevent things, you have to decide what's going to be best to treat this. And that I will submit to you. If anybody thinks they have the absolute answer to that, they should tell us. Because certainly in the United States, you could go to a hundred different good centers and you're going to get a hundred different answers because as we're going to see, the science of this is challenging. 30% of the population in the United States at some point seeks a care from a physician or a provider for spine pain. So it's one of the most ubiquitous things that exists in medicine. And in the United States, it's over $30 billion a year is a very, very conservative estimate just taking care of spine care. A couple more parameters before we march on. The patient just wants to get better. Again, I know that seems blatantly obvious, particularly to non-surgeons. But for those of you who are surgeons here, when you go to a neurosurgery conference, surgeons get so into the surgery, the first thing is frequently forgotten. I just want, if I have strep throat, I just want the easiest way in and out the door. If I have appendicitis, I don't want anybody making it complicated. I just want my appendectomy and be gone. So the, I, whatever you can do with the least amount of friction possible. Friction was actually a term coined by Karl von Clausewitz in 1859. He was a Prussian general in old Germany. And he said friction in war is what separates war on paper from real war. War on paper is very simple, but he said, the minute the first contact happens, it rained hard, it was colder than we ever thought it would be, it was hotter, there was a sandstorm. All the friction, and surgery is the same way. It all sounds good in conference until the first cut's made, and that's where the friction starts. So it is with all of the care in spine. The friction starts right away. In my opinion, having done, like I said, over 10,000 of these cases surgically, the history is everything. For me, I see every new patient myself. My PA and my NPs and my residents do not see any new patient in my office first. I do. Is it inefficient? Yeah, it's inefficient. I'm the busiest neurosurgeon for almost two million people, so that's my, an my answer. Somehow I manage to do it. It takes a lot of time. But in the brain cases, my residents can see a brain case and give me the history, and that's all I need, and we go by the study. In the spine, if you skip the history, you skipped the most important part. Because 95, more than 95% of spine patients don't have a finding. No matter how good you are at looking, most of them don't have a finding. It's all listening to the story, which takes time to evolve and time to get good at eliciting the story. But if the first, if the history's not done properly in spine, the case is doomed before it started. Guidelines are good. Now, this is the kind of stuff that's going to be offensive to some people. Guidelines are good. We have all kinds of guidelines. 
my chairman, when I was, it was a long, you know, long time ago when I was a resident, but my, my chairman did not allow pre-printed orders because he said it means you're not thinking about the patient. You're not thinking about that person as a human. So you, you just punch buttons. Uh, we have, now everything's computerized where we are, so everything comes up as a pop-up screen. And I can guarantee you, my residents frequently, oh, I forgot the insulin order. They're diabetic, well, let me go back. You know, guidelines are good, but to some degree, you have to be careful because guidelines take away the art of medicine. And people say, yeah, but in the airline industry, in the United States, they're always comparing medicine to the airline industry. P patients are biologic specimens. Aircraft are a physical structure in a physics environment. And physics is math and it's very predictable. You know, what's the barometric pressure? What's the headwind? What's the air density? Blah, 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 blah. Biology is not like that. That's what makes biology beautiful. It's also what makes biology dangerous. So I'm all for guidelines are good. But if you take away your thinking and you just pull out your paper, they got this, this, and this, they go down that limb. You never, that's, that's designed for the simplest person on the team, for the person who really can't think at all. So you get a guideline. Guidelines are good, I like them, I use them, I make them. But you always have to use your head in biology. If you're gonna really excel, there's a lot more than just the guideline. Now, this is gonna, everybody here is gonna say, but I already know everything there is to know about the spine, and that's probably true, but we're still gonna go over it a little bit, because again, just from the surgeon's perspective. I look at a spine very different today than I did five or 8,000 operations ago. You know, you take them apart, you see what happens two days later. You put them back together, you see what happens six months later. So my way of looking at a spine evolves a lot and it will probably, hopefully, continue to evolve as the years go by. So I just wanna go over a few things so that when we go over cases and options, we have a, a fun, it's all based on the physiology of the system. Just like if you're talking about the hepatobiliary system. If you don't understand a little bit about it, it's hard to, do, it's a lot more fun, I would add. It's a lot more fun to look at a patient and see the machinery in your mind. And as you listen to them, to kind of imagine what's going on. Just like a good car mechanic, you know, just to, to know enough about it so that you can, it's more fun to know how the machine works. Now. This is a lumbar spine, but it's, it's a system that runs from the bo top, bottom of your skull, obviously, all the way to your tailbone. Keep in mind, this system is been, it's one of the most consistent designs in nature. I mean, if you look at the spine of a, a buffalo or a deer or a cow, structurally, they're very similar. Even aquatic spines are very similar. When you take that structure and stand it, from the top of your head to your pelvis, there's nothing else holding you up. I know, for the physical therapists out there, chill out, I get it. You got muscles and I got a six pack and that's all good. It's great to be in good shape. But muscles are not hard point structures to hold up your whole body, right? If you take the spine away, it'll collapse. The, you get two ankles, two knees, two hips and simplistically, you think about it from the bottom of your skull to your tailbone, there, to your sacrum, that's the only hard point you got. So the forces on these joints are unbelievable. If you put clickers on a human volunteer, and every time you turn 20 degrees, the clicker records it, you make, on average, five million cycles a year. Five million. Most of the people that come to my office say, Doc, I don't understand why this happened. Five million turns a year, right? If you drive your car, every time you turn it on, the water pump's doing something. But people don't, because you can't see the spine, when people blow out a knee, I think they kind of look at their leg and think, well, you know, no surprise that happened. But people don't think of the spine as a set of joints, and it is a set of joints. Vertebrae, disc, vertebrae. Everybody's disc focused. The more spine you do, the less disc focused you will become. Discogenic pain? Some, pretty hard to prove that's the only place it came from. Pretty hard to prove. In discography, one of my very good friends in the United States wrote one of the biggest articles on discography that was ever published. And I said, Tom, I, you didn't strike me as a discography guy. He said, I'm not. I think it's not very valuable. I just wanted to show it was safe. 
There's a lot of art form in this stuff. So if you're a discogram person, I'm not picking on it. I'm just saying that's another one of the many things that have been around for 40 years that we really don't know all the validity or lack thereof. The disc allows you to articulate. It's what, allow, it's what changes this from a solid structure to an articulated structure. Transverse process, so there's the vertebrae, the disc. Transverse process, the pedicle connects the vertebrae onto the posterior elements, but it's the posterior elements that actually provide the support. This provides axial support, but the support of the spine that keeps it from moving in an anterior posterior dimension is the facet. So the articular facet comes down, joins its mate, runs through what's called the pars interarticularis to the next joint. So there's a sequence of these claw joints that run all the way from the top of the head to the bottom of the head. Mechanical pain originates in most, almost exclusively in the joint structures of the spine. This is going to be important as we go through some case examples, right? So the patient that comes to your office and says, my back's killing me. It's right here. Sit, stand, walk. You got a choice. What do you want to do for 15 minutes? Sitting's okay. I can sit. Can't stand. I can't stand. 10 minutes. I can't stand. I got to sit. It's right here. That doesn't originate for the most part in the neurologic structures, it originates in the joint structures themselves. And so that's going to be one, not to put a guideline, that's going to go down one highway. Now, obviously within the spine also, aside from being a set of joints to hold you, to give you height, and to allow you to move, it's a conduit for all the electrical cables that go. Obviously, remember, there's no spinal cord in the lumbar spine. Spinal cord starts at the craniovertebral junction, terminates about L1 in an adult. In infants, of course, it's lower. It, it ascends as you grow. So by about L1, L2, there's a little variability. You have the cauda. So you have nerve root, but not spinal cord. Huge difference because the cauda is much more tolerant than the cord, obviously. Now, midline pain without any neurologic symptoms. Symptoms, not signs. 90% of people with a huge disc don't have a lot of neurologic findings. Oh, they might have a foot drop. 4% of total. 4%. Okay? In the cervical spine, my, trice, my biceps is killing me, goes into my forearm. My fingers are numb. And you do the exam and you don't find their fingers are numb. You don't find anything. That doesn't mean they're a liar. It means that sensation is a very difficult thing to map out. Best done by the patient's history, I might add. But most patients, even patients that have neurologic involvement, historically, from what they tell you, don't have a finding. But the patient who has pure, mechanic, pure low back pain, it's all right here in my back. And sometimes that'll, of course, go in the top of the buttock, but they really don't have anything distal to the inguinal crease. It's pretty much all rotator muscle of the spine and midline. By definition, that almost always arises in the joint surface of the spine. Now, one thing, what to watch out for, when to worry, and this is the first hit. The first person that sees the patient is usually the person who either makes it good for them or dooms them, okay? So when I'm teaching the residents, some of the way the residents are taught, you know, the attendings give them a list of 40 things that can give you low back pain. No one's going to remember that, right? No one's going to remember 40 things that give you low, you don't need to remember anything. Make it simple. It's called an arrow test. Just every time I see a patient with low back, the person who comes in, 25 year old, says, boy, for three weeks, it's right, it's right there, into the top of my butt. Is it going to your legs? No, no nothing in my legs. Any numbness? No numbness. You don't find any weakness, you don't find anything on the exam. It's back pain. Probably mechanical joint pain. 98% likelihood it will be, but if you skip this, that's where it won't, you'll get away with that for 10 years. But if you see a large volume of back patients, those are, right? Everything in medicine that you remember best are the times you really got nailed and missed it. And you find out two weeks later, hey, did you hear about that guy? I'll give you an example. We had a, a 26 or 27 year old athlete, actually, who developed very acute back pain playing softball for the university. 
He came in, he had terrible back pain, started between his scapula. By the time he got to the non-acute trauma center, you know, so the, our trauma center is divided into acute trauma where you're sick, and then we have it called, it's called the no hope ER, where you're just seen by whoever, you know, whatever, third year medical student. They were seen, diagnosed with musculoskeletal low back pain, went home, and died because they had Marfan syndrome, undiagnosed Marfan's. And what with Marfan syndrome can give you back pain? A dissection, an aortic dissection. So he, dis he dissected his aorta and died. So those are the, I'm sure the person who saw, you know, it can happen. You know, they did, they were very tall and in retrospect they said, yeah, sure looks pretty Marfanoid, but the patient didn't know they had Marfan's. Nobody else did, and the person that saw him didn't know Marfan's was associated with that, which is maybe understandable. But all you need, you don't need to remember aortic dissection, which can cause back pain. When I was a resident, we had a young woman who came in. She got triaged as mechanical low back sprain. She got her CAT scan, and her CAT scan diagnosed her pregnancy, which was causing her back pain. Right kidney, blah, blah, blah. There's a Hodgkin's disease, leukemia, invasive colon carcinoma, prostatic carcinoma. There's a million things that cause back pain. Are they going to get you often? No, but if it catches you once, the patient will never forgive you. So all you need to do is an arrow. You start going through the skin. Is there anything on the skin that can cause back pain? Melanoma. I look around. I look for things on the skin. You don't need to remember anything other than if it's not normal, it'll slap you in the face. Oh, they've got a big port wine stain on the back of their skin. Maybe they've got more embryologic stuff deeper down. You don't need to remember it. It'll slap you in the face. Can muscle cause back pain? Sure, muscle could. Skeleton, yeah, skeleton could. Colon, colon can cause back pain. You just walk through. Can pancreatitis give you back pain? Sure it can. So all you need to do is start one side of the skin, go right through, and come out the other side. You don't need to remember any diagnosis. It'll walk your, all you need to do is think what's there. It'll come to mind. Now. That'll help you decide what studies you're going to get, if any. Now, lower extremity symptoms, once that patient says, so you want to sit, stand, or walk? I, I'd rather sit. Standing's not too good. Goes right in my butt, right in my hamstring, and then down my leg. Well, that's nerve, obviously. That's neurologic involvement, whether you find anything on the exam or not. Sometimes they will give you a gift, and they'll have a weak anterior tibial. Okay, it's L4 or L5. Oh, do I need to worry? Everybody get my dermatome chart out. Why would you do that? I mean, all you want to do is get to the right testing program. You don't, don't waste a lot of time, you know, with your dermatome thing. That's S1. I mean, it's nice to know that, but it actually isn't essential. So don't, I wouldn't overdo that. You know, you'll spend a lot of time doing stuff. You could use your brain for other things. If you get in the target, you'll be close. But hamstring, quad, okay, those are two different nerve patterns, but you're still getting to the right study. And that's what you want to get to the study so the study gives you the rest. If it's in the leg, well, then that's nerve involvement. And a lot of people actually have both of these, obviously. Let's just, for example, you get up, you walk out of here today, you turn to pick up a cup of coffee, and it just, your back blows up. Because the minute the disc disrupts, it's holding half your body. So you're pivoting on a broken disc, which hurts. Then, as the fragment migrates out under the nerve, then two days later, that's a very common story. My back was killing me for five days. Now it's my leg that's killing me. That implies disrupted joint with neurologic involvement. And if you find something on exam, it's good. But don't skip the history. Sit on the table. You got back pain. Let me take a look. I don't find anything. That doesn't mean anything. Most of them don't have anything. And the ones that do are the most obvious cases and the easiest ones. No clear trauma on the exam. When do you do the workup? This is very controversial, and this is why this is probably more than any other part of the problem with guidelines. This is there's no right answer to this. Use your head. Use your brain. The person who comes off the soccer field and says, I felt great till that guy need me in the back. All right, well, you don't, you know, you don't have to go crazy with the arrow test. Obviously, it just started. It's probably not something you're going to get hurt, burned on because you missed something. The answer is obvious. He got need in the back, and probably that's where it all began. We'll go from there. 
That kind of patient, if there's no neurologic issue, you're best to go with conservative options for probably a couple of weeks. 73% of people are better in four to six weeks, no matter what you do. It's been studied over and over and over. Nature is pretty smart. So nature does a lot. Conservative care can do a lot. PT, injections, those are all great options for that kind of person. And when's the time you get the study for that person? I'm not worried about missing something. And as long as the patient's OK, I can keep seeing them 10 days, 14 days. A lot of them will be better by that point. And you don't need to do anything much more. The people that are a little more difficult is the person who it isn't brand new. And when it started, isn't that obvious. And that's a lot of people. I came to the soccer game today, but I haven't felt good in a couple weeks. When did it start? I don't know. I mean, a couple weeks ago. There's no, he doesn't remember exactly when it started. That person troubles me more because there's more things that come into the diagnostic entity. So you have to use your head. If the person gives you the flavor, I've had some blood in my stool too, or my, I've had blood in my urine. I had a guy who came, you, and you have to really pound the history because people want to come, they want to give you a reason a day. I had a guy who came to the emergency department and the residents called me and said, this guy digs these big holes that they put pipes in by the highway. And he fell in and his back hurts. So he fell in the pipe. They said the only thing that's odd is he got a temp of 101.8, which is 38.7 or 38.8, I think, something about that. So... I said, why does he have a temperature? And they said, no, I don't know. I mean, he must have something else going on. Well, actually, when you went and talked to the guy, he looked sick as snot. He looked really pre-septic. He was hot. He had a white count that was 16 or 18,000, and he had an epidural abscess, which we took out, big pocket of pus over his spine. And actually, when you talked to him, I said, how did you feel before you fell in the hole? Uh, I haven't felt good in a couple of weeks, Doc. I don't know what it is, but I just didn't feel that good. But I, then I fell in the hole. My back really hurts now. He wanted to give you something. Fell in the hole. That's when it started. But you have to pound away at the history, and you have to listen, because it's more important, actually, in the spine, in some ways, than the exam. Now, <coughs> spine, this, just a couple other points before we go through some cases. One of the problems in deciding what to do with the spine, and one of the big problems with making guidelines, is that spine is a very heterogeneous group of patients. So when somebody says, so how do we decide, let's make a guideline for back pain. But back pain comes from, it, it's been there three months, it's been there two years, it's been there five days, I got hit in the back with an, it's such a diverse group of patients, it's very hard to do research that's really meaningful. Different ages, different body sizes. It's a very challenging statistical analysis to do this, which is why the literature is all over. We run into the same thing with head trauma. You know, they took 2,000 cases of head trauma at the Medical College of Virginia in Richmond and tried to stratify them. And it, what they found out is you almost can't stratify it. Some of them went through a car window. Some of them got hit in the head with a bat. Some got hit in the head with a ball. Some fell down. They're different injuries, and so it is with spine. It's a very challenging group. For the surgeon, we have one absolute criteria for the surgeon. For the surgeon. If it's not focal, I can't help. Surgery is a focal event. Surgery is a targeted event. To some degree, injections are similar in the sense that no target Probably not much of a yield, potentially. The nice thing about the injection options is you, you know, it, you can take, it's not going to hurt them. So if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. What I do, surgery is like salt on your food. Once it's on, it's on. So surgery shouldn't be used. You don't put more salt on until you're sure you want it because you're not taking it back. The injections and PT, those are all nice things because there's no irretrievable aspect to them. But everything we look for as a surgeon is focality. If there's no focality, the person who comes off the soccer field says, my back is killing me. I can't stand. I certainly can't play. Five weeks later, you say, all right, I'm done. Let's get an MRI. And you get an MRI, and then that's nothing. I'm going to get a CAT scan. You get a if there's nothing focal, I have nothing to offer. Patients, at least in my part of the world, 
Patients think if the pain dial is turned high enough, if I have enough pain, they cut me. N nothing could be further from the truth. We don't cut you because you hurt a lot. We cut you because you have a focal broken part. No broken part, no surgery. And a lot of the other things don't work as well either. You know how difficult it is to quantify this because at least where I am, our institution used 13 different pain scales at one point. 13. Now, you, whenever there's 13 ways to do something, you know none of them work or there wouldn't be 13 ways to do it. Furthermore, I don't know how many, you're a pretty young group here, I don't know how many of you have kids. Once you have kids, you know what pain scales mean because I have a kid who broke his arm. He was playing football with a policeman. The policeman fell on his arm and he got an open fracture on his arm. He said almost nothing about it. Took it like a champ. I have another kid who I love just as much and if he hurts his fingernail, it's like he had open heart surgery. <laughs> so anybody who has kids, you know, so, oh, his, we took everybody whose pain was an eight. Some people's eight is different than somebody else's. And that's another inherent, if we had a blood test that followed a pain protein, right? You know eventually that's going to come. It's already come from sleep. At my institution, they did a great research project they published in Nature Medicine. And when you sleep, there's a neuropeptide that shows up in your blood that only shows up when you sleep. So it turns out when you sleep, your brain flushes chemicals that it wants to get rid of. So presumably, that's why you sleep. Because it's not like your brain needs to stop moving. So someday, they'll probably have some blood test and somebody says, I'm in terrible pain, and you do the test and you know the answer. But right now, it's all based on how much they think they hurt. And everybody's different with that. So garbage in, garbage out. If you look at a trial called the SPORT trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, I know a lot of you people are probably New England Journal of Medicine kind of people. It's an internal medicine thing. I am proud to say I have never subscribed to that journal. But aside from being proud to say that, some of it I'm sure is really good, but some of it's trash. And the SPORT trial, when you read the SPORT trial that looked at Surgical versus conservative therapy. It's, it's probably the most oft-quoted series in the United States on taking care of spine. The first two pages are this rigorous methodology that gives it an aura of science. But it is an aura only. Because when you really look at it, people, 30% of the one group bounced into the other group because they decided they didn't want to be in that group anymore. And the whole thing is based on 13 different pain scales. So the aura of science was really not that scientific. Any data is good, so data is good. I'm not knocking it. In fact, the guy who wrote it, I liked very much and I would consider a friend. But even he would be the first to say, almost he said after 10 years of specializing in studying spine and its care, he said, the more I know, the more I realize we don't know. There is a role for spine surgery. And as much spine surgery as we do, and I, like I said, thousands and thousands and thousands later, the exact role and exactly when that comes into play is, is different for each person, different for your level in your career, and it's geographically very different in the United States. If you look at fusion rates in one state versus another, it's all over the map, which proves we don't really know all the answers, but I'll give you some examples. It's just how I look at it. I think as a surgeon, you're always best to be as conservative as you can be. I operate on about 33 to 34% of the people I see in my office. The other 60 plus percent I don't operate on. Because if I can't, I always tell my patients, if I can help you, I'll be honest enough to tell you so. And if I can't help you, I'll be honest enough to tell you so. So some of it's money driven in the United States. Some of it's just what people think. But I, as a surgeon, if I'm not pretty sure I can help, I don't want to get involved. And I'm in a system where it doesn't, I don't need to get involved if I don't want to. Who benefits from surgery? We talked about focal and what type of surgery? Well, to show you how uncertain my side of the fence is, and I know you, know, you guys aren't specifically targeting the surgical patient, and I understand that, but when you talk about heart care, you have to know something about bypass surgery. You have to know something about stents, because to know who should get it, whether you do it or you don't, it helps a great deal to have someone who does it involved in the decision? Because you do look at spines very different, differently 
when you've been inside a few thousand times. So in our spine center, we do not have a surgeon stratifying the patients. And they wish they did. We wish we could find somebody who was right at that point in their career where they've done five or 10,000 cases and they don't want to do that anymore, but they can screen patients. Because you can screen patients pretty well when you've been inside lots and lots and lots of times. The problem is we, have not, we can't find anybody that wants to do it. So we have, a, I think, a very good spine center and we've always, we always kid at the meetings, it would be great to find somebody who wants to screen patients who's had the surgical viewpoint but it's very hard to find somebody in our country that wants to do that or will do it. This is just, when I first started doing most of my surgery at, at Unity, I, took my, I still operate at the university, we go back and forth. I, the residents come to me at Unity and I just went there because it's a very efficient place. It's a smaller place and it works like a Swiss watch. I went and worked at Queen Square. Any of you ever been to Queen Square in London? I mean, that's like legend in the United States, Queen Square in London for neurology neurosurgery. And I went there, and the guy who's one of the most famous neurosurgeons in the world, I met him at Queen's Square, and after he did two cases there, he said, let's get out of here. And I said, where are we going? He's operated on Elton John, and, you know, he's operated on everybody in Europe. And I said, where are we going? And he went to this little 200-bed hospital, and he said, I do everything important here, because this place works. Queen's Square doesn't work. So that's actually where I got the idea of doing this. So I work at a about a 300 bed hospital and a lot of it's for us and it works like a Swiss watch if you like Swiss watches. So the first year I was there I just took the five surgeons who did the bulk of the spine surgery. These are the numbers of surgeries they did that year at this institution and I, the, they're just listed as A, B, C, D, E because I presented this to them at our first meeting that I chaired and this is me so I'll tell you that. I did 441 spines there that year, cervical and lumbar, about four, almost 450 cases that year. And the fusion rate is here. I fused about 32.6%, I think. And if you looked at my practice every year, it's about 32, 34%, 33, and it's not a conscious decision. It's just that's, it always plays out about that. We have one gentleman there who does about 93% of the cases are fused. His answer to this was, well, maybe I see a different group of people. I don't believe that. Patients that roll in the door at our place are not that stratified. The patient doesn't say, gee, I think I'll go see the guy who does this or that. They pick the surgeon by reputation mostly. Uh, this is a very financial, I'm just being honest, a very financially driven decision. 93% of people that hit the operating room table were getting instruments. That's changed. There's a place for instruments. Actually, I did almost as many fusions as this guy did, it's just I did a lot more patients to do that many fusions. So in the United States, this is the kind of variability you see. Everybody except maybe this one here is a very honest, you know, well-meaning surgeon, but that's how much difference there is in judgment about who needs to have something put in to fuse the spine, and we'll talk about that with some cases. But even in my own arena in surgery, this is not fully established. Another offshoot of the sport trial was, given the limited evidence regarding most non-operative treatments, creating a specific non-operative paradigm is not clinically feasible. That might be a little strong, but again, just another in the never-ending series of articles to say, this is pretty tough to decide what's your best option. Atlas et al., there's limited evidence regarding most non-surgical treatments. The Cochrane Review and the European Spine Journal pooled analysis showed no significant difference. But again, if you read the methodology for that, it's, it's really sketchy methodology with an incredibly diverse group of patients that you wouldn't probably expect to find scientific data to kick along. Dan Resnick's a pretty good guy at the University of Wisconsin. I thought this was a pretty honest statement. Outcome assessments are significantly limited in their accuracy and reliability. Now, Cabbage, coronary artery bypass graft. The reason I put that up is this. Everybody wants to have a spine data-driven, evidence-based medicine decision. You wait till this day to get the MRI. You wait till that day to do surgery. The problem is, the in the United States, the coronary artery bypass, the heart bypass data is awesome. In the state I'm in, New York State, 
It's a law. It's been a law since 1989. If you do open heart surgery, you have to submit every case to a state database, and that database is published every year with everybody's name. So if you want to know the death rate that your heart surgeon has, you can look it up every year. At first, everybody said, this is crazy, and it's not fair. After two or three years, they said, you know what? It's actually pretty fair. In fact, I'll give the state credit. The government, at least where I am, the government where I am makes a lot of um, not so good decisions. But this is one they did pretty well. When the cardiac surgeons said, this isn't fair, the state said, good, you get 12 cardiac surgeons, you guys make a panel, and you can decide, you can be the authority how you want to do it. So they did. And the data is very good. But the point I'm making is, Cardiac surgery, the data is pretty easy to stratify. This was your ejection fraction before surgery. This was your percentage LAD occlusion. This is your A, you know, there, it's pretty rigorous number data. And with the complication is you're dead. So that was pretty easy. You're dead, you're not dead. The problem with spine is we don't get all these numbers. You know, you don't have all this quantifiable stuff. The heart's a beautiful machine compared to the nervous system. It's fairly simplistic. That's not taking anything away from cardiac surgeons. I'm just saying it lends itself to data-driven research. Spine just doesn't lend itself to data-driven data research so nicely. Hence the problem. Now, a couple cases to walk through. Just because I always learned best from cases. I know they're anecdotal, but they're meant to be anecdotal representative. An anecdote doesn't make for science, but it does make for learning. It does make for learning. I, most of the stuff I do differently, I do differently because I hurt somebody or I killed somebody. And you kill a couple people, you change how you do things. Especially I do a lot of brain aneurysms. You know, you kill a few and you do something different the next time. 36-year-old male, this guy is actually a special forces guy in the United States. He's strapping, totally jacked, you know, unbelievable shape guy. He had three months of mid-thoracic pain into the upper lumbar spine. Young, healthy guy, no other arrow test, okay, arrow test. No diabetes, no kidney problems, no blood in his stool, no blood in his urine. Walk all the way through, nothing. He's got nothing. Healthy guy, healthy guy. It's right here. It's right in my back. And that went on for three months. Now, sh what study should he get for he doesn't remember when it started, but it sort of crept up on him. And three months later, he's got a lot of thoracic pain and upper lumbar pain. Neurologic examination was normal when he was first seen. For the first six weeks, the right thing to do probably as long as there's nothing else, not in a guideline, but in your ears and your brain, there's nothing else that sounds fishy, that sounds off. Probably it's perfectly reasonable to wait four or six weeks. He got some plain films when he was first seen, and they were normal. He got a chest x-ray, which maybe wasn't unreasonable either. And that was okay, and that's fine. Blood work was all normal. Went home, did fine. He came back, and if they come back, where I'm from, we always tell the residents, follow-up's good. It's safe. If you're not sure what to do, just I'll see you in 10 days, because probably things will declare themselves. Then he shows up and he said, my legs are so heavy. They're just so heavy. His exam, the resident said, I didn't find anything. When a patient tells you something's heavy, they mean it's weak. Patients frequently describe weakness as heavy. My legs are heavy. He's a very strong guy. And he said, I, I, when I saw him, I said, so how are your legs compared to two weeks ago? Wow. He said, I was standing... At, you know, I stand in the shower now, and just standing in the shower is hard. And this guy's this big, strapping guy. So I ordered an MRI, and that's what he had at T9. Big thoracic tumor sitting squat right in front of his, there's his spinal cord, right? Vertebrae this, vertebrae, this is the low thoracic spine. The conus is right there at the top of the lumbar spine. Here's his chest, spinal cord spinal fluid, and an extra part that he should not have. This was a benign meningioma. This is a, a very dangerous thing to have. 
Because once you're paraplegic, you're paraplegic. You might get some back, but in the thoracic spine, the thoracic spine is very dangerous for us because the blood supply to your spinal cord starts at your skull base as a branch to the vertebral artery, and it runs down the spinal cord. And there, there's an artery that comes out of the lumbar spine that runs up, and they meet in the middle of the thoracic spine. So the blood supply to the thoracic spinal cord is not good. This is much more dangerous for us than a brain or a neck because the blood supply here is so bad that the artery is less than two millimeters wide. If it spasms while you take this out, they're paralyzed. So this is a picture I took through the microscope when I took it out. I did a standard laminectomy, took it over to the facet, so I had a little more wide exposure. This is his thoracic spinal cord right here. Remember, your spinal cord is almost exactly the width of your finger. It's the exact size of an index finger. And there's his tumor right there. So this was a nice benign tumor. It came out very nicely. And that was a little over two and a half years ago, and he's done very well. But the MRI saved his bacon. Now, is that, you know, you could order 100 MRIs, and you may not find that, but once in a 1,000. or one, But for him, that was everything. The nice thing about MRIs, it clears all, most of the bad stuff is out the door. Could he have had testicular carcinoma? Yeah. Testicular carcinoma up the retroperitoneum, you can get back pain from that. But the MRI would have caught that too, probably. So, you know, a lot of the stuff, the nice thing about MRI is even if you didn't think of it, it does catch, the reality is it catches a lot of things. 27-year-old, daily unrelenting low back pain. This um, um, young lady is a very aggressive diver. So she was in a high board diving competition. She said, I threw myself into position when I left the board, and it felt like my buttock blew up. Then she had back pain down the back of the leg, into the calf. One of the reasons I use this as an example, it's not so much whether four weeks is the time you ordered the study, or eight weeks, or seven weeks, but that clearly is not right. This poor person, young person, spent a year of her life hobbling around with all this leg pain, dense numbness in her foot. So she's got from her back into the butt, into the hamstring, into the calf, and numbness in the foot. She had some findings on her exam. She had a little bit of a gastroc weakness. She had a dense numbness. But the real point is that's clearly not the she had had like 20 injections and you know she that was exaggeration she had seven or eight and you know she really got run over the coals a lot which doesn't make the the those things wrong to do it just if they're not working it three or four or five months probably you've given it a real try so nothing on the arrow test plain films that was reasonable to do they were normal now do you go with a cat scan or an mri and when do you get it well like i say it's not this day or that day. She failed a couple injections, okay. She failed six or eight weeks of physical therapy, okay. Because most people don't. 90% of people don't need anything more than that because they get better with nature and conservative care. They don't need anything else. I'm at the end of the funnel for the person who doesn't get better. But it's 12 weeks or 16 weeks or 18 weeks. If you're not getting better, it's time to move on. That's her MRI. Belly. Buttock, sacrum, disc, vertebrae, disc, vertebrae. L5 vertebrae, that's a disc fragment the size of my shoe. This is not subtle. Just for the record, that operation took 26 minutes because I looked it up before I put the case in. It was 26 minutes to take care of that after 12 months. And she did fine. She kept some of her numbness. But, you know, that's, people don't, numbness, long-term numbness, because we have a lot of patients that have this for one reason or another, Numbness, your brain will forget. It will not forget pain. Pain, the way the brain is set up, pain is like a smoke alarm. It just keeps going on. Numbness, you're, I don't think about wearing glasses. Those of you that wear glasses, you don't get up, you don't spend all day thinking, oh, I have glasses on. Because you're, when you first get glasses, you do. But your brain finally says, okay, he wears glasses, so give it up. But pain, your brain will not give up. Chronic pain is terrible. This is a big, just an axial view of a big chunk of disc. That stuff, incidentally, for those who don't do surgery, they always say it's gel. 
it is not gel. Okay? It doesn't look anything like gel. Many thousands later. I do maybe two or perhaps three teenagers a year for disc herniation. Two or three a year out of 500 cases a year. And they're always physiologically big. You know, they're big athletes. They're big kids. So the stress is adult stress. They're never regular sized children. And the, and the young, in the 15, 16 year old, the disc is fairly jelly-like. By the time you're 20, game on. It looks just like lobster meat, crab meat. Looks just like lobster and crab meat. It's exactly like that. When that fragment comes out, when a leaf leaves a tree, okay, are there any trees here? Okay, there's a lot, there's a lot of trees where I am, okay? My whole backyard, it, at the end of the fall, there's six inches of leaves all over the yard, okay? But when a leaf leaves a tree, what happens to the leaf? It dies, right? Because it's not part of the tree anymore. So no glucose, no photosynthesis, no biosystem. So the leaf dehydrates and shrinks. When that disc fragment blows out of the disc space, it's not part of the biosystem anymore. So it dehydrates and shrinks. So we have to be fair. Surgeons that operate on people in two weeks and say almost all of them get better, most of them would have got better without you. So nature is smart enough to dehydrate and shrink that, which helps us all, surgeons and conservative alike. 28-year-old soccer player, acute onset of low back pain, no radicular symptoms, okay? Terrible low back pain, terrible low back pain. Nothing in the legs, nothing. Nothing on exam, but more important, nothing on history. Does it go into your legs? Doesn't go into my, doesn't go into my legs at all, okay? Not at all. Is that more joint or is that more nerve? Joint, exactly, joint. And the purpose of showing this case is this. That's his MRI. Pretty unexciting, actually. Nice spinal fluid column, couple little nothing. You know, those will get read as, you know, degenerative disc or something, and that's fine. But this is basically pretty unexciting. And that's a CAT scan. So vertebrae, pedicle, facet. Vertebrae, pedicle, facet, oops. Fracture through the pars, spondylolysis. That's a pars fracture. That really wasn't well visualized on the MRI. You know, there's MRIs at MRIs, you know. Sometimes the patient's moving around, they can't stand being in there. Sometimes the MRI is one of these, you know, 0.3 Tesla things that they drive around in a van. And sometimes they're great. So, it, you know, the cat, if you don't find it on the MRI, what's done where I'm in the United States, if your first MRI doesn't show it, the next test is usually another MRI, and then another MRI, and then another MRI. If the first test doesn't work, it's like a homicide. If there's no fingerprints, look for hair. If there's no hair, look for blood. Look for something else. So the CAT scan can be helpful. I don't use it as the primary study because it isn't very good inside the spinal canal. So I always get an MRI because that's preferred because it takes care of most stuff. I'm just saying that some patients, CAT scan is still very helpful sometimes in patients with mechanical pain. This is actually a psychiatrist I saw, and she was actually pretty normal for a psychiatrist. They're usually not very normal. Neurosurgeons are unbelievably normal, as I prove. So this was her MRI. Again, I'll just spot it to you. Pretty, you know, she had a great story. My back hurts. It goes in my buttocks and in my calves. I walk in the store. I have to bend over the cart. It was a good story. So I was kind of disappointed. So I ordered a CAT scan myelogram. Now, if there's a radiologist out here, there's always a radiologist that says, why would you do a, a myelogram CAT scan is still a very good study in the right patient. It's a different study. It's a nothing study now. It's all water-soluble dye. So there's her CAT scan with her laying on the table, but look at this. Lo and behold, she slides her L4 vertebrae seven millimeters off the top of L5 on a flex film. And that's her myelogram. Nice column, nice column, boom. Almost a complete block because she's sliding on a flex X film. So if you don't nail it on the first study, an MRI is a good place to start, you can move on from there. Orthopedic surgeon's wife, you're thinking, but we deal with athletes. This must be an ancient person. This is not. This is a 34, 35-year-old wife of the biggest joint surgeon in Rochester, New York. It says something that he brought his wife to a neurosurgeon. I'm just saying, okay? <laughs> I'm just saying. And when he brought his wife to me, he's every, he does a bazillion joint hips and knees replacements. He said, don't tell anybody I brought her here, would you please? So 
There's her belly, vertebrae disc, vertebrae disc. Look at that lowest joint. She also has some steep angle, right? Steep angle. And the steeper the angle is, it's more common in women, they beat this joint up because the angle throws the force to the lowest joint greater than normal. So is this focal? That's the beauty of this. This was focal. Focal, focal, focal. All back pain, no nerve. So I put inner body cages in her. Just cages, took about 80 minutes to do. And she, last Thanksgiving, we have a holiday called Thanksgiving, and she said, that's the first Thanksgiving I've made dinner. I didn't think about my back once. This is an NFL football player. Just to show CAT scan myelogram, we'll stop in a minute for a couple questions. The, this is a CAT scan myelogram. It's cutting his head off, right? Axial slice. This is left. This is right. Here's the disc and vertebrae. Here's the facets. Actually, when you go through all the facets, they laid out pretty similarly. Here's the spinal cord. Nice. You can even see the cleft. There's the die. goes right out that side, but no die here. And the reason I did this study is because when I saw him, his MRI said it's a 5-6. It's got a 5-6 disc, a 6 disc. But I did this crazy thing. I actually examined him. And he had a weak triceps. You can't get a weak triceps from C6. So I did a myelogram CAT scan, and that showed a C7 compression. So this is a, so called a foramenotomy. I made an incision in the back of his neck. You lay the muscle off the lamina. So the lamina is here. I made a little window. That's about that big. The, the hole you make in the lamina is about the size like that. That's his spinal cord dura. There's his nerve root. And there's the fragment. Just like a piece of lobster. That's a 45, 50 minute operation now. You can break this all into mechanical and neurologic things as we've talking, talked about. But one thing I would just emphasize quickly, in the thoracic and cervical spine, if you're wrong and you miss an, in, an unstable spine, the penalty for the patient will be enormous. If you miss a cord compression, the, pain, the, the danger is high. In the lumbar spine, the danger is much less because it's cauda. So in the lumbar spine, we walk a lot slower than we do in the neck. This is a 28-year-old male. Is it a birthday party? 28-year-old males do these things. He bet his brother he could do a backflip. So his brother videotaped this. So I have a beautiful videotape of this guy doing this to himself. So he jumps on the trampoline and he does the backflip. And when he hit the trampoline, he screamed. His neck was killing him and his thumbs were numb. That's all. He was laying on the ground saying, my neck hurts. Went into cervical collar. Vital signs are normal. Full strength everywhere, okay? Neurologically, all he had was numb thumbs. How bad could it be? Well, this kind of thing deserves a plain film. Just on the story. Some people deserve a film based on the story, right? Just like cardiac care. I got chest pain. You already bought yourself an EKG and a troponin, okay? You already bought it. You land on your head this hard, your neck hurts, you get a plain film. Two disc, three disc, four disc, five. Complete subluxation. 85% of people with this are quadriplegic. That's called jumped facets or fractured facets. The only way your head will come that far off is if you either jump the facet or break the facet. That's his CAT scan. And that's his MRI. There's his spinal cord. He is a lucky, lucky man. And that's how I fixed it. I, I did them from in front, put a plate in front. We don't use halos anymore, like never. So I put a plate in front, and then we flipped them over, and I put screws and rods behind. I did them front back because he's basically decapitated. You, don't, you can probably get away with just doing either front or back, but I did front back because he had vaporized the capsules around his facets. I want to make sure that we finish, so I'm going to walk. This is just a young woman, just to show you how dangerous this can be. This is a woman I did New Year's Day. She woke up with neck pain. How many people here have woke up with neck pain? Right? I mean, like almost nobody has it. Very benign story. My neck really hurt when I woke up. I guess I slept wrong. And then over about six, and there was no reason to panic. She was in the ER. There was no reason to panic. And over about six hours, she went completely quadriplegic, and all she could do was this. That's it. It's an unusual story. It's only 5% of cervical discs. But she blew a huge chunk of disc right into her spinal cord midline. 
Usually the posterior longitudinal ligament will prevent that and it sends it out to the side because nature is so brilliant. But this lady, we just did this from in front, took that fragment out, and that's how I fixed that. The point is, even those stories, it's all just listening and following. She didn't have anything on her initial exam. Listen, follow, and an MRI will get you a lot of things. Now, bottom line, if it's midline and it's paraspinal, it's joint, plain films are fine. They're not, you know, everybody says, oh, they're a waste of time and they're not sensitive. I mean, they're not super sensitive, but you'll see, there's no harm in that in most people probably, and you will get some data from it. MRI and CT sagittal CT are appropriate, as I show in the examples. The exact time frame, to be honest, I know it's not going to help a guideline, depends on the case and it depends on my index of suspicion. If it's a clear-cut story, I'm perfectly good to wait six weeks. If it's a story that's got some heavy legs, any neurologic findings or any subsystem issues, blood, you know, I'm gonna work, I'm gonna spin the MRI quicker on those patients. If it's neurologic elements into the extremities, MRI is a great study. It's gonna catch all the subsystem issues, it's gonna catch most of what you want. And for the some case for the occasional case that that doesn't give you what you need, CAT scan myelogram is a very straight up study now, and it gives beautiful detail for us. <coughs> I don't usually get that. that th those people would never even see me for six or eight weeks because they go through the conservative arm first, which is very appropriate. As long as you've got your eyeballs open for the arrow test and for other things that should urge this along earlier, neurologic deficit, of course. But I can't emphasize enough. A lot of it's the story. The more you do, the more you'll be able to smoke out things that are concerning and don't seem right. And then which, whether you go down the conservative route or the surgical route obviously depends a lot on wh what the study shows and how the patient's doing. Interest of time, I'll stop. Any questions? Thanks very much.